Looks like we are live. I've got the notification. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I'm Jenny Hatch. I'm the executive director for the Sierra Nevada Alliance. And I have a script that I'm going to read here in a second, but going off script, I just have to say that there is really nothing lately that brings me so much work joy as when we are doing an event like this and I see this kind of response and community. It just makes me feel so happy that just to see you, <laughs> um, just to, that we're all here connecting together on something so positive is really a blessing. So thank you for being here and joining us today. Um, so um, the Sierra Nevada Alliance, if you are unfamiliar with who we are, uh, our mission is to serve as a hub for stewardship of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Um, and we achieve that by, we implement conservation, but we also empower and collaborate with the conservation community, whether that's the public or the other conservation organizations at large. And we are empowering all of those people and the organizations and the things. So one of the ways we serve and engage with the conservation community is by putting on monthly webinars. And we've been doing it for about a year and a half now. And our goal with these webinars is to provide resources for our, our conservation member group partners and other conservation organizations and relevant agencies in the region and to engage with the, um, and educate the public at large um, to really create more stewardship for the Sierra. Sharing opportunities like our free monthly webinar series is just one of the ways we provide accessible resources, events, and information that elevate and support our unique ecosystems and communities. If you didn't know, the Sierra Nevada is one of the biodiversity hotspots in the world. And so it's a special, region. Uh, we love being able to put on these events for free. And I want to acknowledge today that we were able to do this special webinar with Dr. Feeney, um, thanks to some grant funding that we had available from Patagonia. Uh, and in honor of Black History Month, we really wanted to do something special. And so we are just so lucky that this came together. Um, and we're honored. We hope that you will enjoy this webinar and support the work that we do. Um, I hope you'll consider making a donation on our website uh, so that we can continue to do this kind of work um, and really just continue to raise the bar on what we're providing and connecting the conservation community on. We'll send a follow-up email to all of you guys who participate with how to make a donation if you aren't familiar with our website. And then just a little friendly reminder, again, it's free. You don't have to, we just would really appreciate it so that we can really um, increase our conservation impact. Um, we will be moderating this webinar with questions in the comments in the chat during the presentation and then leave time at the end. It can go, you know, we might go over an hour. Um, we're flexible today on the questions and discussion at the end. Um, Dr. Feeney has been really flexible and wonderful about that. Uh, we would love for you to keep your camera on, like I mentioned before, so we can all feel part of a community conversation together today. Uh, and it's my honor to introduce this month's speaker, Dr. Carolyn Finney. Um, Dr. Finney is a storyteller, author, and a cultural geographer. She is deeply interested in issues related to identity, difference, creativity, and resilience. Carolyn is grounded in both artistic and intellectual ways of knowing. She pursued an acting career for 11 years, but five years of backpacking trips through Africa and Asia and living in Nepal changed the course of her life. Motivated by these experiences, Carolyn returns to school after a 15 year absence to complete a BA and MA, gender and environmental issues in Kenya and Nepal, and a PhD where she was a Fulbright and a Canon National Science Scholar Fellow. Along with public speaking, writing, media engagements, consulting and teaching, she served on the US National Parks Advisory Board for eight years. Her first book, Black Faces, White Spaces, Reimagining the Relationship of African Americans in the Great Outdoors was released in 2014, and recent publications include Self-Evident, Reflections on the Invisibility of Black Bodies in Environmental Histories, Beside Magazine, Montreal Spring 2020, and The Perils of Being Black in Public. We're all Christian, Cooper, and George Floyd, The Guardian, June 3rd, 2020. She is currently working on a performance piece about John Muir, the N-word, Nature Revisited, and is the col new columnist at the Earth Island 
journal while doing a two-year residency in the Franklin Environmental Center at Middlebury College as the Environmental Studies Professor of Practice. So with that, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom today with us, Carolyn, and I'll turn it over to you. It's an honor. Fantastic. Hey, thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you, Patagonia. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone who came on today making space for this. And, you know, my heart just wants to just like, who wants to hear me talk? Let's just have a conversation. But I'm also here to kind of seed the conversation in a really particular way. So I'm going to talk for a little bit, actually. I'm going to put up some slides. I'm going to tell some stories. I'm going to lay some truths down, truths as I see it, um, in order to open up the conversation. What I'm hoping you will think about as I put this stuff out on the table is um, I don't like it just to be an information dump. So part of me having conversations about race, diversity, power, privilege, environment, place, identity, belonging, all those issues is not only how much information, what do we learn about it, but how do we develop practices differently? Right. And part of that sometimes is just managing to ask the questions and have the conversation. So all questions are good and comments are good. I'm less interested in you agreeing with me. I'm more interested in all of our voices getting in the room as much as possible. So I'm going to go down here to a little my little screen share. Don't get scared when you see all these slides. I'm not going to show them all, but sometimes I just can't make up my mind, you know. So um, I'm going to start it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know where I'm starting now, right? So I call it Black Basis, White Spaces, Christian Cooper. Christian Cooper, John Muir, and the um, playing the long game. Okay, so I've been putting this up and calling the stories of now. One of the things that I really like to do is, uh, that I always do actually, is think about where we are at any current moment. And yes, this is my perspective of that, but there's something really broadly contextual we know is, is taking place, particularly here in the United States, as it has to do with COVID and the pandemic and how we've all been affected in some way or another. Um, the really out loud conversation we're having about systemic racism brought on in part by the um, murder of George Floyd. Um, and also we had an election where, you know, I had that picture of the map in the background, you know, in, in privileging thinking about political parties, the Democrats, the Republicans, blue and red states. And for many people saying, well, you know, we're, we're so divided. And one of the things I always like to say is we've always been divided. I wanna really put forth that ever since Christopher Columbus lost his way, you know, that diversity really got broader than it was before and issues of division were already there. So division isn't actually something new. The way that it looks, the way we handle it, the way we don't handle it. Yeah, I think that actually is new um, and something to talk about. So I want us to be embedded in that because we are. You know, for me, this isn't a separate conversation. Um, I'm looking down at my notes and you see me do that because there's some things I wanted to be sure that I said. I wrote here, but I believe any practice. So we can talk about content, which we're gonna talk about here, but we're also talking about practice. Um, and let, you know, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, JEDI. I mean, we've, we, we, most of us know these acronyms about how we're coming to this. And for me, talking about the practice of how we do this isn't simply about, so what can we be doing if we're not already doing it? What can we be doing better? Um, we're often doing these things within organizations, institutions, agencies, where we think we can do them without changing anything about the organization, institutions, or agency. And that's one of the things I also want to come up against and kind of lay out in the room, the idea that we think we can do something without changing the box that we're already operating in. And I actually don't think we can, or at least we can't do it very well, right? We keep coming up to that wall in a very particular way. So for me, I talk about it as challenging the ways and means, the rules and regulations. Um, so we have to think about this in a multi-dimensional way. We all can't do everything, but we need to become clear with who we are, where we stand, and what actually can we do, and what are we willing to do, and how are we supported to do that, and if we're not, how do we build our capacity around that? Also, there's, a, for me, the thing about perspective. So one of those sort of invisible lines of you know the boxes that I think we operate in, in this country around story and perspective is the way, particularly when we're talking about the environment, 
that we privilege whiteness. I know I just said it like that. And I'm always clear to say whiteness isn't a bad thing. Nobody can help the skin that they were born in. But for me, it is, as James Baldwin says, it's about power. And part of that power is being able to center a broad and diverse perspective, in this case, whiteness, at the center for all human beings, <laughs> for everyone else. And it becomes the way we tell a story. I don't care what that story is, the history of who we are, the environment, whatever is which we center that right in the middle. And the question for me is what happens to all those other experiences and points of view and how powerful it is when you actually recenter that to allow a different perspective to take center stage. And what is it that we learn and gain from that? So this seems random that I'm gonna talk about Lovecraft Country as an example for a moment, in part because I love science fiction and any excuse I have to talk about a show that I really like, I bring it in, right? So I'm not gonna give away anything if you haven't seen this series. It was on HBO in the fall. I thought it was brilliant for a variety of reasons. But I wanna talk about it in relation to the idea of what stories and what experience what experiences get centered in a story. So this is, this story is set in the 1950s. It starts off in Chicago. It makes its way back and forth to Massachusetts, but it centers around an extended black family um, who's at the core. The primary characters are black. And there's witches involved and magic involved and monsters involved. Like, so it is what I like to say, Indiana Jones meets Lara Croft, Tomb Raider, and some other stuff thrown in. H.P. Lovecraft, who wrote this story, wrote science fiction, something called weird fiction. So, it, and it is weird, man. It, man, it's just all like packed into one series. Um, the thing about it is, right, there's part of the story right in the beginning when it shows this black family, this extended black family in Chicago, they're all gonna pile into this car, they're ready for this road trip adventure, they're going to Massachusetts because there's this white family who's like witches and practices magic and there's some connection and they're gonna you know, go and find out what it is. So they've got all that excitement and anxiety that you always, you imagine characters have. They're about to go on the road and do this thing. It's gonna be kind of scary. Who knows what they're gonna discover, but they're ready, they're game, they're down. As they're getting into their car in Chicago, the matriarch of the family isn't gonna join them. She's gonna stay at home with one of the younger kids, but everybody's excited. They're piling up all their suitcases and stuff in the car. And she comes out and she opens up her, her notebook and says, okay, let's just go through the checklist really quick. And she starts like, do you have enough blankets and foods? And real, what she's doing here is that in 1950, it was Jim Crow. So if you were black and you were gonna go on a road trip, you better make sure you had everything you needed for that road trip in the car because there's a really good chance you might not find a restaurant you could stop at, a bathroom you could use, a hotel you could stay in. So you need to make sure. And she was doing this, it was almost a throwaway comment. Like she was doing it. But it wasn't like this is the story about race. She was just doing it because this is what black people had to do in the 50s if they were traveling you know, on the road in the United States. A little bit later, they're on the road trip. They're down the road. I think they're in Massachusetts. They hit this county and they get pulled over by a white state trooper. And it's a few minutes before sundown. And the white state trooper walks up and you already know this backstory that he's a nasty kind of guy, but he's a white state trooper. It's 1950s, it's Jim Crow. As he comes up and he starts, he starts to talk to them and say, do you know that in a few minutes, you're gonna be in a county that's a sundown town. And if you're in a sundown town, <laughs> all bets are off about what can happen to you. And sundown towns are a real thing in this country. They were in the past, some would say, they still exist in the future. If you're black, if you're non-white, you don't wanna be caught in any of these towns or counties after sundown. And he was like, you got seven minutes to make it. And so for the next seven minutes, you're like, oh my God, you're watching them panic to make this. And then, then there's a following scene where they're in the woods with big, scary monsters with blood and teeth and all this other stuff happens. The point that I want to make that really blew me away about this narrative was they, they pointed to things that would be very human about scary monsters and you know, excitement to go on the road and bravery and, and, and cowardice and all that stuff was in there. But because it was told from the perspective of African-Americans at a time in a country where there was Jim Crow segregation, it centered the story in a very different way. And so this is what I always say to people. What happens if we center the story different? Where, who can we connect with? Where, what are the human elements of that story? But what is also revealed by understanding that as a Black person at this time, it's going to be a different story 
99.9% than it would be if a white person was having the same experience. One's not better than the other, one's not more valid than the other, but they are a very different understanding of what is happening and your ability to move across the landscape in this country and just be full of yourself as a human being and make those discoveries for yourself. So I always tell everybody, and, and people have heard me talk before, the reason I put my story in here is because it's actually an invitation for you to consider your own. Everybody is biased. Everybody. I'm biased. You're biased. Everybody on here is biased. And bias is not the same as prejudice or racism, which doesn't mean they can't be like close relatives living together. If you are not clear about what your biases are, they may tip themselves over unintentionally into this place where it can be perceived as prejudice and or racism, right? So I always start off with my own story because I'm incredibly biased about my perspective around race, the environment, this whole conversation about diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, that's me with my dad, this is 1962. Um, I talk about, yes, and before I go to the next slide, I wanna say that I say that all knowledge is subjective. We bring all of who we are to bear up on anything that it is we're trying to understand. Right. All knowledge is subjective. Also, this, this is incredibly personal for me. It's personal. It's professional. It's political. It's intimate. One does not come without the other. When I show up here to have these conversations, I'm really glad to do it. It's how I pay my rent to do it. But I do this for a much deeper reason. And it isn't only about me. It's, I could say it's about the ancestors, yes, but it's also about other people who exist right now. It's about others who are yet to come. There's a bigger issue here. There's emotional labor also being played here, not just the, doing the homework, but it's understanding what does it mean to show up wholly and fully, to have what is and has always been in this country, a hard conversation to have honestly and hold collectively across our differences. So uh, I will very briefly say this because I've talked about this a lot. And some of you may have heard me say this before. You're my parents, Henry and Rose. This picture has been taken in the 50s. They grew up in Floyd, Virginia. They grew up poor and very large black families, um, both high school education. When my dad came back from the Korean War in the 50s, much like uh, Lovecraft Country, because they started it right after the Korean War. Um, he came back, he was looking for a job. He talked about going um, to the park service actually because he saw a park service um, person in a, in a uniform and he thought that looked like a great government job. And he was told, I'm sorry, we don't hire Negroes. And so my parents, a lot like a, like a lot of black people in the South, moved North and they went to New York because he thought he might have a better job opportunity. And when he got to New, New York, he had two job offers. One, he could be a janitor in Syracuse, New York, which is about five hours North of New York City. But the other was 30 minutes outside of New York City, the other job offer. And that was the job they ended up taking. It was in Westchester County and a very wealthy Jewish family owned the estate. A few of the photos you're seeing in front of you, the one with the house and the trees in the corner um, was part of that estate, stunning estate, 12 acres. There's a small pond, a swimming pool, vegetable gardens, fruit trees. They needed full-time caretakers for that estate because they weren't always on it and somebody is always gonna be taking care of this land. My parents took that job my father was also the chauffeur. And for a short period of time, my mother was also the housekeeper for their house. Um, in the end, she stopped doing it because both of my parents' mothers had been maids for white families. So this was something she was really trying to get away from as best as she could. Um, they were the, we were the, so my parents wanted to have kids. They thought they couldn't. And so they adopted me with the help of the owners. They figured out how to do that. And then what I always say is a few years after that, they relaxed and had my first brother and then some more relaxing ensued and they had my second brother. This was a, a very wealthy white neighborhood. Harry Winston had property down the street. Schaefer of Schaefer Beer lived next door. We were the only family of color there until the 1990s. Um, a Japanese American woman moved in for a couple of years and then she moved out. So you'd start to get a sense. And a lot of them have these beautiful houses and spaces, though I do believe this was the biggest piece of, of real estate in terms of the size of those the 12 acres and what was on the 12 acres. The story that I always tell everybody is I, when I was nine, so not much older than this picture you're seeing here, I went to public school and walking home from school and I was right around the corner from the house and there were um, policemen patrolling the area in cars. You know, a white policeman pulled me over right before I, I got into the driveway and he asked me where I was going and I gave him the address and he just looked at me and said, oh, do you work there? 
And I remember feeling confused and think, and I answered, no, I live there. Like I was nine, what would I be doing? You know, kind of thing. Um, and so he let me go. And when I told my parents, my father called up the police station and he really gave him help. I said, and they never bothered me and my brothers anymore. But as an adult, and I know many of you've heard these stories in the news, I have to think about where were the logics there? Like I was nine, it was a certain time of day, I had a school bag, what was going on in his head that the only way he could imagine me in this beautiful surrounding was if I worked there even though I was nine. I wanna jump ahead a little bit. This is the big house. So the house you saw on the other page was actually the gardener's cottage that I grew up in. Uh, and this was the, what I call the big house where the owners would come up to on weekends and holidays. Um, I want to jump to the 90s. The patriarch had already died. The matriarch was now six, sick. My mother, my parents had been caring for this land for 40 years at this point, for more than 40 years. And the question is when she passed away, would they be able to stay on this piece of land? This land in the 90s was worth, was worth over $3 million. Property taxes were $125,000 a year. And so there was no way that that was going to happen. Though to her credit, the matriarch thought about trying to keep them on this land, but it wasn't gonna happen. So they sold the land to a new owner and they had a house built for my parents in Leesburg, Virginia, because at this point, me and my brothers were grown ups in a way, but my youngest brother had married, had kids and was living in Leesburg. So that's where they decided they were gonna settle. So they had a beautiful house built for them on about a half an acre of land. The matriarch died, a new owner came on, my parents stayed on until 2003. So now they've been caring for this land for nearly 50 years, right? Um, when they left in 2003, this is when the stuff really became personal for me because I watched my dad in particular get really depressed. He talked about missing the land. He talked about not having any land to pass down to his kids. And I had to really contend with the idea that we could never go home again because this place will always be home for me. But unless I win the lotto, <laughs> I'm never gonna be able to go here again. About maybe four years or so after this, my parents received a copy of a letter, which I have from the Westchester Land Trust, because a conservation easement had now been placed on this estate. And they sent a letter to all the old neighbors to let them know why. They said, you know, all the environmental values, the wildlife on this property, where it sits in the watershed, why it should be protected in perpetuity. At the end of this letter, the Westchester Land Trust thanked the new owner for his conservation mindedness. He'd been on the land for approximately three years. My parents who had cared for the land for 50 years didn't even get an honorable mention. They didn't get any mention at all. And just that fast, they were erased from the environmental history. And that's when I started thinking about all the people in the history of this country, particularly black and brown people whose labor, whose love, whose presence in relation to our natural resources, to the environment, as you see here, isn't seen, doesn't count, has been erased, is diminished, is extracted, is transacted, is borrowed. We could keep going with that. And what is lost when that happens for all of us? And how might we change that? Because that's really what I like to do. So I ask this question when we say public, what, when we say public lands, what public are we actually talking about? There's now a gate there. You, we can't get in. My family and I tried to get in a few years ago. And somebody can ask me at the end, there's, a, there's some new developments at play, but I don't have time right now to talk about it. And if you're interested, uh, I can bring that up because it, it is relevant to, to, I think, what can happen in terms of institutions and organizations using their leverage to change the story. So the other thing that I always say for me is um, how this is, all, it's always a moment of convergence, but I think we're all living it in this country in a very particular way. I mean, we're all living it uniquely, but there's something at the collective, at the national scale that's clearly happening, whether we admit to it or whether it directly impacts us you know, or not. I, as you can see, I have all these images, you know, slavery, um, Japanese internment, indigenous removal, the pollution of the land. And right more or less at the center is this picture of Gifford Pinchot, who founded you know, the Forest Service and forest management, this idea of conservation, a way for us to manage resources for our use. And the famous picture of John Muir and President Roosevelt, 1903, on overhanging rock in Yosemite, having what I imagine to be a really a, a powerful conversation about concepts like wilderness and national parks and, you know, who are we going to be to the rest of the world? What does this land mean? How are we going to take care of that over time? 
They're all, both of these things, Gifford Pinchot and Muir and Roosevelt, late 1800s, right around there, early 1900s, right, are taking place. The question I have to ask myself is not what was missing from their conversation, but what was going on at the same time from another perspective, right? So that's why I always go back to 1862 and the Homestead Act, because I think the Homestead Act, right, which I never thought about before I did this research, is in one of our most powerful pieces of legislation, because it changed the way that we as a collective nation relate to the issue of land, right? The Homestead Act gun goes off at midnight for the most part, if you were of European descent, you could go out on that land, put your stake down on up to 160 acres. And if you stayed on it for five years, if you built a structure, if you farmed or you know, had a garden, the land was yours free and clear. I still, every time I say that, I'm like, oh my God, man, I don't think that can happen anywhere anymore. Land was yours free and clear. And remember, land isn't just about land. It is about economic and political power. It is about legacy. It is about the right to say that you belong. Now, I'm really clear about taking nothing away from these European folks who came and did what they did. They took big risks leaving their own country, leaving their own original homes to come over here, right? And put their roots down um, and create a new life for themselves and their family. And something like 60% of them did not survive it because you could die from something as simple as the common cold. So my interest is not in diminishing their experience, but I have to also ask the question, who were the, who had to be removed in order for them to have that land for free? Who was removed, not just removed, but sometimes killed in order for that land to be available. And three years later, when enslaved Africans are free, they're given 400,000 acres of land until white plantation owners said, oh my God, we just gave people that we considered our property 400,000 acres of land. And land isn't just about land. It is about economic and political power. It is about legacy. It is about the right to say that you belong. I do not think so. And they take all that land back. And for the most part, people of African descent could not participate in the Homestead Act. You did have some African-American homesteaders, but nowhere near the numbers of the European um, homesteaders who were there. So now we're starting to see this real differentiation. And then Jim Crow segregation's in place. So when these three men are thinking about what they're doing, what does that mean for people who are non-white? We don't even have to bring the gender thing in yet. Let's just start with the race piece. If you are non-white, what does that mean for you? that your ability to participate, to engage, to move forward with your life, to live your dreams, to imagine the potential of the world, to have yourself seen as fully human. Because you know, we weren't seen as fully human. We weren't considered fully human. This is like a station identification commercial break for a second. I'm gonna come back to that for a second because I always like to put my metaphorical Afro in here and imagine all the things and ideas and people that I carry around in my brain and, and I can change this all the time, right? Just to say that there are so many different people and who influence the way that I think. Everybody, I'm not saying you think this, it's just not, it's not about all black people. When I think about black people, I don't only think about other black people. I think about all people and the way they've impacted myself that a good idea is a good idea. And how I might have to twist it or apply it or, or dance with it a little differently. Because oftentimes, in this country in terms of what knowledge gets privileged and produced, the experience of black and brown people isn't always and has not always been seen as having value and, and hasn't always been affirmed. And we're still having this conversation today, right? In academic institutions and in TV and media, on and on and on, right? So I also have people in my head, I wish weren't there, but that's another conversation. And I did really have an Afro with overplucked eyebrows, seventh grade, yikes. So, you know, one of the things that I always like to push is this James Baldwin quote that not everything can be that, not everything that can be faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced because I feel like it encompasses everything. You know, when people say to me, well, that, that the past is past. I said, well, really? How do you think we're still standing here in this moment right now? Do you think this is because we've all like moved on from the past? that we're not connected to the past, that there isn't consequences, that there isn't legacy. I think that's one of the reasons why we're stuck 
It's because our inability or the lack of our capacity to actually reconcile what that past means for us right now. Wherever we go, there we are. And if 2020 didn't bring it to you, well, I don't know what can, because here we are still having this conversation in a very particular way. And just because we're talking about the environment does not change a single thing. One of the things that's challenging, I think, for a lot of us is to think, well, but we're talking about the mountains or the beach or the forest, and it's kind of benign or it's out there and everybody can go. And I'm here to tell you that is just not true. It doesn't mean everybody doesn't love it. It doesn't mean that there isn't a yearning for it. But the idea that everybody's point of view and perspective is allowed, that everybody has mobility, we already know that's not true. Christian Cooper, <laughs> that is just one of like a thousand stories like that that happen all the time. I've had it happen to me. There may be some people on this, on this call today that have had it happen to them, um, which comes back for me to thinking when we say public lands, what is it that we mean? So for me, we've been bamboozled. We have this idea of this universal environmental narrative of who we are. I'm not saying a narrative is wrong, but I'm saying it is highly incomplete. It is highly incomplete. And the hubris, the hubris that people can say, this is universal, this is for all of us, as opposed to being more generous to consider, this is one of the things that happened. This is one of the ways to tell that story, but this is not the only truth, right? This isn't the only truth for all of us. I'm watching my time here. Um, I talk a lot about representation because the images and stories we see, and particularly the images, and I often put up this image here of LeBron James and the supermodel Giselle Bündchen on the Vogue cover 2010, first time a black man had been put on the cover and how many black people got upset by it. And they got upset by it because they said, you finally put a black man on the cover. And why does he look so primal and primitive with his mouth open? Why couldn't you have made him more elegant and dignified? And then somebody uncovered this poster from 1917. That's this poster from 1917 same color dress. And the editor said they knew nothing about the poster, which I don't believe. But more importantly, it actually points to a history of Black people being dehumanized. So saying they're connected to nature, you know, how for like the back to nature movement and all these ideas that, you know, I have an idea anyway, we are all nature, but that's a separate conversation for the moment. But for Black people and Brown people, we were often put on display back in the 1800s and early 1900s as the very thing you want to move away from. We were put on display at the World's Fairs. We were put on display at places like the American Museum of Natural History. We were put on display, which immediately separates, you know, separates us from being fully human, kind of placing us out there. So yeah, you know what? A lot of us are kind of sensitive. When the first self-identified African-American man became president, when you started to hear people like Glenn Beck say things like Obama's Planet of the Apes, and when the stimulus bill came out and Sean DeLotus did a cartoon in the New York Post, and there's a dead chimpanzee with stimulus bill, you know, pinned to his chest, two white cops standing over him with a smoking gun, you might say that's provocative. But some of us are going to say, man, that's hitting a deep wound that has never been healed, in part because it's never been acknowledged. That is not outliers. One of the things many of us have discovered in 2020, if that who didn't know it before for many of us is that, oh my God, we're, we are also that thing. We are also, that, that in part is what systemic racism is, not just embedded in institutions, but embedded in cultural practices and behaviors, right? Um, whew, I'm revving up here. There's something here that I want to talk about, but I'm going to leave it alone around outreach. We can come back to that because I want to stop talking soon, but I want to get here first. Um, because I said I was going to talk about John Muir a little bit. One of the things that has been really interesting for me is how last summer we started to see these articles in the Washington Post and elsewhere about John Muir being called racist. Um, and as somebody who has lived in California for eight years and served on the National Parks Advisory Board, I've been saying it for a long time. But here's what's also true. He's not only racist. The thing is, I understand you know, especially spending time speaking with his great great grandson, Robert Hanna, and others that he was also part of a larger family, that he had a, an incredibly critical eye to look at non human nature, that his 
a commitment to that, to taking the time to see it. His love for it was clear. It's really powerful. His access to people like the president so he could get these ideas put out there so that we might take some of what's useful and find a way to become better guardians and be in better relationship with our non-human kin. I'm all down with all of that. But he was also racist, you know? So I can't, I can't in my black body ignore that. It actually hurts me, you know, to read his stuff you know, a thousand mile walk through the Gulf in 1867. And he can say one really nice thing about the sunset. And then another, he talks about the ugliness of black people. I can't ignore it. You know, privilege can ignore that. That's the privilege I don't have. And so for me, how do we address that? Because actually that gets at the complexity who, of who we are as Americans. That he could be, um, part of him was really decent. And part of him was racist. And how do we hold that? How do we get to a moment when Christian Cooper walks into Central Park, um, a self-identified gay black birder asks a white woman to put her dog on a leash as you know, the signs are saying. And her response was not, you're threatening me. I'm gonna call the police and tell them this person is threatening me. It wasn't, I'm gonna, you're threatening me. I'm gonna call the police and tell them that a man is bothering me. Her response was, I'm gonna call the police and tell them that an African American man is threatening me. And what I really appreciated, if that's the right word afterwards, is when Amy Cooper said, it's like, but I, I'm not racist, I'm a Democrat, I'm progressive. And, it, and I was so glad she said that out loud because I was like, yes, I believe that entirely. And something in your consciousness, something somewhere where you went, right? You weaponized his skin color because whether you knew it or not, you actually said the thing that you thought might get the police attention. And that's for real. And that happens all the time. At the other end of the continuum, you could get murdered if you're on the street or you can get murdered if you're hiking or in a car or if you're sleeping in your own apartment. We know that these things are true, right? Um, but the continuum where many of us live all the time is right where Christian Cooper inhabits. So I've been thinking a lot you know, about being in conversation with John Muir, Muir, and this is why I'm working on this piece, to imagine not his story at the center and not mine at the center, but what happens when they meet there. That's the new story. And that actually for me is the more real story, the more spacious story, the one that makes possible all of us to step up. So this is kind of where I wanted to end. Two more things and then I wanna open up. I'm looking at my clock to make sure I don't go too far over. And what I mean by the long game. Um, a, a piece I had just finished writing for, for, um, for the Earth Island Journal where I called it the long game. Um, you know, like a lot of us sure in this space, I have been exhausted this last year. I have been angry a lot. I, you know, I live by myself here and I'm in Burlington, Vermont, the second whitest state in the country. Vermont's beautiful. I know a lot of amazing people here. So don't mishear me. And it is also the second whitest state. And I live alone and it's a pandemic and I'm having these conversations all the time. And I've been sort of holding that in a very particular way. And most days I hold it pretty well and some days not so good, right, around this. And, I, and I'm tired, but I'm also incredibly hopeful because I have never experienced anything like I'm experiencing right now of people inviting and wanting to have this conversation out loud. For me, it bodes well for us being able to meet who we actually say we wanna be, you know, of doing the hard work right now of the, you know, we've, ripped, we've been ripping that bandaid off, we're ripping it, we're ripping it, we're ripping it, and really dealing with what that pain is when we rip it off and how do we show up for it. Um, it on the inauguration, and I'm not getting political, though I am, this is also political, so it's hard not to. The thing that stuck out for me was when um, the senator, the Republican senator from Missouri presented um, Joe Biden with the painting that you're seeing here, Landscape with Rainbow. I had never heard of the artist or anything right, by Robert S. Duncanson. But when they said Robert S. Duncanson was a black man and that he made this painting of a landscape with a rainbow in 1859, I felt like my head, the top of my head blew off because I went, okay, he was black in 1859 when slavery was happening and what he imagined 
was this landscape, not just a landscape, but a rainbow, which you know, for me symbolizes possibility, you know, promise of a future. He could still imagine that. I read about how he had you know, um, challenges with mental illness and the, all the prejudice. I can't imagine what that man was dealing with on the daily and he could still imagine this. And what I say is that he was playing the long game. The idea that you may not be here for that result. There is no end game to this work. The shift in practices, the changes that have to take place. But for me, it's how we show up at every moment in this. And it is about taking risks in order not to gain. And there isn't a single thing comfortable about this. And I say this with my heart wide open. And I say this with the deepest understanding I can have as a fellow human being. If you are comfortable doing this work, I'm sorry to say, I don't think you're actually doing the work because I can tell you I'm never comfortable and being comfortable is not the same as being safe. I believe everybody should be safe, but there is a ton of discomfort here. Are you kidding me? This is uncomfortable stuff to really show up. You know, um, Sam Grant, who's an African-American man, he's the executive director of 350.org in Minneapolis. Uh, we were in a conversation early last week and he talked about we have to come to the edge with our heart wide open, but we have to all stand on our edges to do the work that needs to be done. Whether it's around diversity, the environment, we have to be able to stand there. And what does that look like? One of the last things I want to say to, to everyone is, I've been saying a lot lately to people, especially people who work like many of you in existing environmental organizations and institutions and agencies. You don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater with respect to the time and work that you and others in your organization have put in and that knowledge is valuable. You don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater, but you definitely need a new bathtub. If you think you can do this with the same rules and regulations and here's the organizational structure and this is how we do things and you, we, we've been doing that. We've been trying that for, for, I don't know, a few hundred years. We have tried that. Diversity is not about assimilation. As somebody who has been, people have tried to assimilate me and because I wanna belong and be in, in, in healthy relationship, I, wanna go, I went along with it for a little while. I don't go along with it anymore because nobody gains from that. So if you are engaging a community, a set of individuals you're trying to hire in your staff, a set of ideas, it means your organization is going to have to change organizationally, like how you do things is gonna to have to shift. It's not just about bringing somebody in to carry that and to assimilate to you. That's why I was saying, you know, earlier when I was talking about, I put up a slide and I went past it and said, this isn't about outreach. Outreach means you can outreach to me, you bring me to your table and you're really nice, right? This isn't about being really nice either. Right, you bring me to your table, you make room for me at your table and I have to proceed to learn everything about the table but you don't have to learn a single thing about me beyond my name. What actually changes there? We talk about retention often being a challenge for predominantly white organizations that want to invite, invite in black and brown people and I'm privileging race, understanding there's all kinds of difference here in the room. You know, but what does the organization actually gain beyond a, sim a symbolic being able to point to somebody and say, we got them here. And I'm being a little rough knowing that, you know, that's not always, there's other things on a continuum, but often that's what it ends up being. I've been that person and then had to walk away because I can't carry that by myself and I should not have to. It is not my job or any persons of color job to carry all of that. It is our job collectively to do it, but we're all not gonna be doing it in the same way because we all have different work to do. So part of it is that internal assessment, the personal internal assessment, and I'm not assuming you haven't done this, I'm just saying this, the organizational internal assessment, the understanding of where the leverage points are, what are we willing to change, what you know, what is the difference between the aspiration we say we have and the intentions we've set for ourselves? Do they match? You know, are we actually doing the practice there? Do we understand what it means to play the long game? Okay, that's really where I wanna stop because I wanna open it up because it's more, but I wanna, I want, these are my, I just wanna show you some pretty pictures. These are my parents on the estate in 2003 in front of the weeping cherry tree that my father gave my mother for their 40th wedding anniversary, but they couldn't take it with them. And there's a whole story there. Um, isn't that, 
in that. I just look at this, it makes me want to cry because I can't go back there. But, you know, but I always say that non-human nature in part is beautiful simply because it is non-human nature. But I also say in the case of this estate, as well as other places, it's also because of the labor of people like my parents who cared for it for 20, 24 seven, 24 seven. They've been engaged and love it in their own way. Okay, I'll stop there. Alexis, let's do it. Let's have a conversation. I'm gonna get off share. So I can see people's beautiful faces. Where's the share button. I don't know. Sorry, you all, I can't seem to find the. Oh, stop share, there you go. Okay. Yeah, definitely. We can open up to questions now. Uh, people can put their questions in the chat and I can share them. Uh, also, it's up to you, Dr. Finney, if we want to let people unmute themselves and ask out loud. Yeah, if they, if they, yes, do it that way. I love to hear human voices. <laughs> All right, if you have a question, you should be able to unmute yourself and you can also put it in the chat and I will make sure that it is read out. We have a couple. I just wanted to say thank you and hi, Carol and Dr. Finney. Um, just call me Carolyn. So it, it's Beth, hello. I know oh, it's hard to hey, Beth. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm looking around the screen. Yeah, no, who is it? It's so great to see your face and thank you. I mean, you know, we've, uh, thank you. You, I put in the chat how much I've learned from you and how much you've impacted how I approach my work and how then my organization approaches the work. So it's been great to learn from you. And this talk as always was both, you know, not just educational, but moving and, and helps me just be better as a person. And I just want to put a plug in for your book and your articles for everybody here tackling this work. Um, Car you know, Carolyn, you just approach it in such a way that how could we not be compelled? And yeah, enough with Muir. Like, we need new voices. It's not about dismissing, but th thank you. <laughs> thank you, Beth. Mm -hmm. This is Jenny. I just have to say, um, Dr. Finney, thank you. Thank you. Uh, echoing all of what uh, Beth just said and just thanking Beth for making the recommendation of asking you to come speak with us today. Beth serves on the Alliance board and we're grateful to have her. Fantastic. All right, we have a question in the chat from Sarah asking, how do you work with people who are interested at the surface level but don't want to hold themselves accountable? How do we hold them accountable or do we not? How do we move people to want to change? <laughs> oh, how much time do we got? Okay, that's a great question. So. So one of the ways I can answer that is from my personal uh, personal experience, because I, this is what I do pretty much 24 seven. I've sort of been building this public platform for about six years. And I have to tell you that, and I only go somewhere when I'm invited because that's part of the way that I hold people accountable. So every, from the minute somebody reaches out to me and possibly to engage, and I do this at multiple levels, right? It might be, come speak to us, come facilitate a conversation, consult with us, whatever it is. For me, the work has begun, even if they don't realize it. So I'm always thinking strategically, how do I create a space within which they are, they, they're gonna to have to make the step forward. I'm happy to do, as James, Senator James Clyburn says, if there's five steps between us, I'm happy to take three of them, you know? but you still gonna have to take two. <laughs> so I'm always looking for thinking about strategically, what does that look like? Because you can't make anybody do anything, but I do believe you can offer a situation that allows space for them to show up. I also believe in meeting people where they are, which means my homework in part becomes figuring out who people are to the best of the ability. If it's an individual it's a, if it, or it's an organization. I use storytelling, not just because I'm simply trying to be entertaining, I use storytelling because I think it's the why, it's so accessible, everybody has a story. I talk about myself in part because I'm trying to disarm, but I'm also trying to um, be open, create vulnerability and create trust. So if I start with myself, not because it's all about me and my big head, and I do got have, a, I literally have a big head, but that's a whole nother thing. But uh, 
you know, it's actually, it, it, it says that I'm not coming in here to point at all the things you haven't done. I'm not coming in here to begin this conversation by saying, oh my God, you're white, so we know it's gonna be bad. Like, I'm, I'm just saying things like, I'm not. I'm coming in here to meet you as a human being and I'm gonna notice uh, things, but uh, first what I'm gonna do is be responsible for how I bring myself into the room. So, the, the, you know, how do you grow the practice of? What is that whole idea of modeling the behavior, right? So it's like, I can't tell you to do a thing if I'm not trying to do it myself. And I have decided, and everybody who does this work does it differently, okay? I had just decided I'm, if I'm sitting here with you, I'm gonna give you the benefit of the, of the doubt. And I'm gonna talk about things like um, attending to the impact of your good intentions. You know, one of the things I've often heard is you, you do something around this work, it hurts somebody and you say, I, I didn't mean to do that. I have good intentions. I said, that, fine, you're, we're humans, right? So we make that mistake, but I wanna know what you're gonna do now. That's what I wanna know. Are you gonna show up? Are you gonna follow through? Because attending to it is actually hard, harder to do. But that's actually where the moment of emergence can happen, the possibility of something. So then that's where the internal assessment comes in is what is the capacity you have to do this work, both as an individual, as an organization. What's the self-education that has to happen, both as an individual and as an organization? Um, your edge, you know, I think our edges are different for everyone, but I know part of my edge is I have to be willing to say what I don't know. And sometimes you don't know what you don't know, right? But, you know, sometimes you do know what you don't know, but you kind of, you know, your privilege may let you kind of not know it. <laughs> just be like, I'm just going to ignore it, right? So part of it is really coming to terms with that and saying, well, what do I need to do to actually, so I can get more, so I can increase my ability to engage that because that could be just the place, the place that I'm avoiding that's actually causing a lot of the problems. What am I willing to risk in order to gain something instead of worrying about what, what it is that you might lose? And that's a big one. And I, and I mean that at all scales that only each of you can decide for yourself from your job to your position, to your colleagues, to your boss, the agree, you know, there is nothing easy here. You know, I had to make that decision when I, it was, if I, there was things I could have shifted and I probably have gotten tenure at Berkeley. They fought over this work. This is what it was. And I had to really get clear and I needed a job. So I want to be really clear, right? I'm not operating with a secret bank account. You know, I have massive school debt, but I knew what was more important just for myself. You know, and so these, this is real. It's real work. It's real work. I think it's worth it for a thousand different reasons, but it's real work with real risk. Great. I had a question. Um, my name is Autumn. And I'm going to get my camera on. Okay. Um, hey. I, I was. Hello. I was yeah. wondering if you had any experience working with land recovery for indigenous people and bringing that conversation to different organizations or departments to push that narrative forward. Yeah, I love that. And I, and Autumn, thank you for that. And what I forgot to mention is that I'm on the traditional land of the Abenaki here in Vermont. And I'm, I'm trying to get better at really being explicit about that where I'm at. So I have never had an, a conversation about that, but I'll tell you what, in terms of my journey around thinking of indigenous presence and relationship to land, um, last fall, it, it was, uh, we did this online. Um, um, Pat McCabe, Women Stand Shining is a native woman. We decided to have a public conversation between her and I for others to watch, uh, sort of looking at red and black, right relations, thinking about the land because it's complicated, right? It's complicated anyway. So land recovery for whom and by whom? The question of reparations, what do we even, what, what, <laughs> what do we mean like for black people, but how can you get something back that was never really yours? Is that what we mean by reparations? And indigenous people are the first people here. So 
should indigenous people be the ones defining that? And wait a minute, indigenous peoples are really diverse. So <laughs> which indigenous people are we talking about? And geographically, where are we talking about? So I'm at that beginning part of the conversation. There's another native woman here that we're gonna, um, she reached out to me, she's Abenaki. And she said, just yesterday I wrote her back. She said, you know, she's been getting in these really difficult conversations with her African-American friends who are calling themselves indigenous to this place. So I think that for me, if I was going to go into and would welcome to be invited to a conversation about land recovery, the work that I'm building up my capacity is to understand where I stand on that personally, what I understand. So not trying to come in and say the right thing, but say the authentic and honest thing and find the way that I can place it in the table. So having these conversations with native people who have said, yes, I want to have it with you too, because I'm, how do I have this with my black friends? Because, you know, we can have it with white people. I'm just going to say the thing. And I'm not even mentioning all the other non-white, I'm just, you know, talking, privileging for the moment, the, the native slash indigenous, the black of African descent and the white of European ancestry conversation, having it with sort of the white of European ancestry, you know, because that's usually at the center. We're usually responding to that because it's been centralized, you know, woo, to kind of shift that over here. And then what if you started bringing in South Asian and let's talk with the Chinese of Chinese, like it really broadens it. But I think that, that that's how I would like to come to that autumn if that answers that for you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. All right, we had a question in the chat from Chelsea Taylor, uh, who asked if you could share more about what happens when the stories meet. Oh, you mean like, um, Chelsea, thank you. You mean like when I'm imagining myself and John Muir, the stories in that way? Yeah, exactly. It's, um, you talked about this kind of being the next direction for some of your work, and it, it seems like a, a good next step for a lot of our work. Yeah, thank you, Chelsea. Yeah, so I've been thinking about this since 2016, right, when it was the centennial. And so there was a lot of acknowledgement about the role of the national parks and public lands. And as my doctor is in geography, and I would used to regularly go to the annual geography conference and a few thousand people. And this year they decided to make it that they invited about seven, eight geographers from different parts of the discipline to sit on a plenary. And then we were all asked to think about the question, is John Muir still relevant? And it was the way that as I thought about it and was preparing, I said, I don't want to come in with just, there's not a singular answer here. But what I wanted to imagine, because I have really, I'm really challenged by cancel culture. And for me, it's not about that at all, because I feel like everybody could get canceled out, including me, <laughs> you know? So I, you know, what, what, and where does that leave us? So I, what I wanted to imagine, and I think something I said earlier was I took a, one of his works and imagined a black woman. I, I created a character, so Jonah Washington Douglas, and I imagined a thousand mile walk through the Gulf in 1867. And her title was a thousand mile walk was rough in 1867. And taking real quotes from his book, both his observations of non-human nature, as well as his racist observations of black people. And I created her experience. Imagine her ducking and weaving across a hostile landscape, imagining that she was too dark to pass. So she had to go use the woods taking real facts of lynchings happening in Louisiana and other places at that time, rolling it into Jim Crow and like I moved it for her. And so part of the meeting is what happens if we're playing, right now I'm playing with the idea of what would a Black Walden Pond look like? We don't, I don't need to dis dismiss Walden Pond, but I wanna take these, they're almost like not just the stories, but they're sort of at the center of the environmental and conservation movement. They're almost untouchable. They're like the grail, you know, and saying that I don't want to disrespect the grail, but I want to imagine the grail in somebody else's hands. And so that's the place where the story can meet. So as I do, I'm doing this one woman show that I'm working with someone to imagine. Um, I'm going to be looking at, at, looking at Muir's letters. I want to know him as a human being because he was, he's a white man, but he's a human being first. I wanna know who he was, how that may have changed over time. What if I imagine 
him and me in conversation. So my life on the land, his on the land, where do those things come together? Where are the tensions? How do we highlight that? What is the new narrative? And because I can't tell you what that is yet because I'm not done. And that's also the point. It's emergent, it's fluid. We all often make these narratives static. Like we're still, you know, we do it all the time. I think in this country, we take something that happened in 1850, 1962, you know, uh, you know, 1985, as though it, and that's the thing. And we're going to hold that now forever, which is one of the reasons our institutions, in my opinion, are so rigid. We have amazing people within the institutions who are, you know, trying different things, but they, excuse me, they can only move so far because the rigidity of some idea um, is over for so long it's just going to breathe. So I'm really interested in what that new story is, but also what is the practice of creating space so the new story can emerge? Or I should say, what are the practices in place? If that makes sense, Chelsea. I see you keep moving on my screen. It's so funny. Yes, there you are. No, it's that's beautiful. And I, just looking at some of these other questions, it seems like how do we weave that narrative and that storytelling into you know these questions about how do we move our organizations a little further yes. and you know just telling a story differently and. Might yes, be a friendly and, way of doing that. Yes, and Chelsea, you so you gave me a perfect opening to tell the thing I didn't have time for, but this is one way that, and this is this is happening. So this is emerging. Um, the New York Botanical Gardens, major institution, right, had reached out to me to come and do a residency last summer for a couple of weeks. They said, for whatever your next work is, I didn't realize the extensive library they have around conservation, you know, everything that they've been doing for God knows how many years. I couldn't do it last summer for the pandemic. I did a webinar for them and I was telling them a lot of the story of the estate and I told them the story about the cherry blossom tree and that my parents had to leave. They couldn't take the tree with them. There's roots in the ground, um, how their story was erased, you know, from the, the Westchester Land Trust document. And they said, you know, we're the New York Botanical Gardens. I bet you we could get on that estate. We could get a sampling of that cherry tree. We could bring it to the New York Botanical Gardens and we could tell a story. I was so deeply moved because I've told the story about my, that estate a thousand times. And I was like, oh my God, I never, that would be amazing. So they could use the leverage of who they are. Well, so that being an exciting thing. And then, so then a, a woman who is a Emmy Award woman, Emmy Award winning film director had seen me speak in Telluride in 2019. She's a white woman who reached out to me with Zoom. She said, you know, I'm doing an HBO documentary on trees. And I thought about what everything you said and realized here I am telling the story of these trees in relationship to different people, but she didn't have any stories of African-Americans. She goes, so she's like, I wanted to talk to you about that. And I said, well, you know, the obvious one is to go for lynching and talk about, you know, black people. She says, yeah, she goes, it's not where I want to go. And I said, excellent because we're not only about the bad things that happen to us in trees. And so I told her the story about the cherry tree as a way for her to think beyond. She liked it so much. That's the story she wants to tell. So the story, so we're all sort of working in tandem. Her position as a filmmaker and a storyteller in the media, New York Botanical Gardens and the institution who reached out to the land trust who said, oh, you know, we're kind of down too. Let's see if we can get access to the property. Now, what happened about a month ago. So they finally got on, they kept writing the new owners. These are brand new owners that I don't know. I knew the owners, it's, it's, it's sold hands again. So I don't know these owners. And they needed access just to make sure the cherry tree was there because everything's supposedly protected. I just assumed it would be there. And um, actually I'm gonna share with you cause I'll just show you, uh, it's almost more powerful than me just telling you. Uh, um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. So this is the picture I ended on. So there's the weeping cherry tree, which you can see and uh, next to a uh, hydrangea. And they went on in December, the land trust to take a picture of the same area, just to make sure the tree was still there. And this is what they got. So it's all been landscaped. The tree is gone, oh. right? So when I saw this picture, I mean, it was like, I was gut punched for two days. And it explained why, in many ways, I don't know if this is the truth, but it explained why the owners weren't responding to the land trust requests. He was trying to explain this project is happening. We just want to access everything, everything. And they just weren't responding. And we're thinking they landscaped this and now they're just feeling, I don't know, they're feeling a way about that, right? So I'm gonna come back to you now. Um, 
And I thought, and all, and the film director was upset because we were going to go on the property and film me in the New York Botanical Garden taking a sample. It was going to be a whole beautiful ending to a, a, a terrible story. After two days, when I got over being depressed about it, I said to myself, you know what? This is the more authentic story. This is actually what happens more often. The thing just gets erased. And not because the people, the owners are bad. They just had no clue. You know, I started thinking about what if before you bought a piece of land and before you were allowed to have that piece of land, you had to know the history of the land, you know? And I realized somebody told me, you know, just because a conservation easement on it doesn't mean that the conservation folks actually thought the cherry tree was worth protecting. These are all the things I didn't know. And so I said, the story now is, which I'm trying to get them all on board, we still don't have the owners yet, is to say, let us come on the land and let me replant a tree. And now, the owners become accountable. The land trust becomes accountable. The New York Botanical Gardens as an institution becomes accountable. The film director is accountable and I'm accountable. That is how for me we move forward. Not simply let's do this favor for this black family and let them have this tree, that's nice. But nobody else has to move, but everybody is using their power. So I think that's the other thing. Um, finding a way into it and, you know, finding a way into it. And I really want to believe in it. And now I'm going to write a personal letter to the owners who don't know me. And I have to find a way into them to say, I'm not interested in shaming you or, you know, you own the land. Hold on one second. Hold on. Somebody's at my door. This is crazy. Come on, come in. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry, I'm on the scene right now. Of course. No, you're okay. Good. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. <F-I-N-E-Y. laughs> Sorry, you all, that was crazy. I put a note on the door, but it was UPS. It's my one real human contact all day. I had to have it, sorry. Okay, so um, uh, yes, there's something for me, like now I have to write a letter. And so there, I'm not saying you all don't do this and I'm guessing many of you do, but the personal investment for me is high. It is not any less rigorous than the intellectual investment or the quote unquote professional investment. Actually, I start with the personal investment because at the end of the day, I might be able to change your mind, but I need to change your heart so you're willing to take the risk. And if you're not, if I can't get you to do that, it doesn't matter how many times I tell you about certain facts or whatever. It's just, I got to get you to feel something and actually see, see, see that tree and see a family that took care of that land so you could come on it. And I'm glad you're there. You know, I'm glad you're there, you know? And so I would love to be able to involve them in that experience. So how do we involve everyone? And institutions, well, agencies and organizations are made up of people. That's the last thing I wanna say about that is to say, I talk and talk about them at that scale. But for me, I'm always talking about people. And so I try to approach people as people and not hold them responsible for the entire institution or agency, but understand that they have a role. But I'm dealing with people, imperfect and perfect all at the same time. Well, thank you very much. I very much look forward to your, to your work and, and hearing more about this, so. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, I had a comment, but I, I can't figure out how to raise the hand, but is this a, uh, I can hear you though. I can see you. Oh, Jackie, is that you? Yeah, this is me. So, God, I have so many comments, but let me see if I can narrow it down here. I just wanted to first um, thank thank you. I'm very grateful for your contribution and all this. And I do see an upside to cancel culture in that I would really like to cancel this culture. And I think we do need a new story. And since humans we live in story like fish live in water. Literally, our reality is created from these stories. And there's nothing more powerful than media to affect the story. And race is a white person's problem. It is up to us to do something. And it's interesting that I've um, run into this my whole life, even though I grew up in Santa Barbara, my mom was very involved in in civil rights. And so in the 60s during high school, I was introduced to Watts during the Watts riots, went to the churches, got involved with Operation Bootstrap. Lou Smith was a friend of my mom's, came to the house and I would did school, go down, get African clothing and literally sell them in the bathrooms at my white school to try to um, introduce the African culture of color into this, you know, waspy school up in Santa Barbara. And I really felt I was, you know, as I navigated through, even as a child, I was very much 
uh, questioning the justice around civil rights, uh, the the raping of the from the Indians to the blacks, the whole thing was very difficult for me, and I wasn't sure how what I could do because I was not um, living in those areas. But what I noticed, and this has been a pattern I've noticed in my life, is instead of joining the riots. I joined Operation Bootstrap and looked at how I could help the enterprising aspect of what we could do move into uh, influence the culture by getting inside that story and bringing it out. That's the responsibility of the white person. And then later on, well, um, well, a couple of things. I worked in Oakland during the Jerry Brown era when things were turning for a company that was all black. I was one of the only white people and it was more equitable then. As a matter of fact, we were getting most of the jobs. And so it was a, it, there, I, I was watching it from that aspect, right? When there was a, a ability to have power based on your creativity, despite the color of your skin. And then fast forward to now, I've been working on my, um, one of my projects has to do with the Washoe culture of stewardship. I've gone to so many Washoe, um, you know, between powwow, tribal meetings, um, their cultural things, everything to get inside their story from in the 20 years I've been here, literally, I've made their Indian clothes. I'm a leather designer. I make Indian looking clothes. I've, I've made clothes for Indians that, you know, Native Americans. And what I've been trying to do is sync up their 10,000 year culture of stewardship with what is needed right now in this pandemic and in our you know, there's no, there's no peace on earth till there's peace with the earth. And so in order to get peace, we have to get justice. And the justice has to also come with our relationship with the earth. And all indigenous people everywhere on the planet had these relationships with the land. And that is why, uh, that, that is how they survived. And that is critical for us right now. So by getting inside the Washoe story and trying to bring it out into the white, uh, tourism culture of Tahoe, I'm working with putting up their Gala Stungles and creating these immersive walks, which bring you into a native mindset of how to be with the land like your parents were, or like anyone was, you can't do that kind of gardening without having that relationship with the land, which is not in the white culture, the culture I would like to cancel as we bring in a new story. And I think I say this um, as just to support what you're saying, that in order to bring about the story, it's the white people we have to, we built racism, we have to take it away. We have to take it away by, by hearing the, the perspectives and understanding how the beauty of this diversity integrates, whether it was you know, selling those African clothing or now trying to sell the culture, 10,000 years of stewardship to the, white, to the white traveler. I think this is on us and especially as environmentalists, there is a lot we can do because we are living on, on land and uh, well, I don't need to tell you. So, yes. Jackie, thank you for that. And I want to offer, I, I am a real believer in actually the relationship aspect of it, not just the relationship to land and nature, but our relationships with each other. And so part of the experience of extraction and transaction, you know, around in the past, around stories, experience, labor, all of that, you know, there's a larger connection to the capital system. There's all this other this systems that are all interlocked in a very particular way that inform our behavior. And I want to point to not only white people do those things. I just want to be real clear, right? Yeah. So we, you know, a lot of us, you know, I, I, I argue that actually all of us are culpable. We're just not all culpable in the same way. And we're not all complicit because they're interlocking six systems. So there's something about, you know, how do we, how do I not repeat you know, something that may have happened before, whether it is that I have been extractive or that I have been extracted. What is it, what do I need to know in order to show up in a relationship so that I can both protect myself and be sure that I'm not actually going to put that on anybody else, right? And make mistakes because, right. you know, we, we have a tendency, I think, as human beings to repeat ourselves. And so, yeah, uh, yeah, we got a lot of work to do. And, and I actually don't, I don't, I, 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 Jackie, you, I, I don't want to can, cancel white culture, you know, because we can have a long conversation about what is that? Because I know it's incredibly diverse, <laughs> you know. I actually, it's, the canceling is not necessarily. So, okay, this is going to sound really, because I love talking cancel about- Cancel the right. cancer in the culture. Okay, okay, yes. I was thinking about, the thing I wanted to say was, you know, I love, you know, I fell in love with um, 
um, Mr. Rogers, you know, when the documentary, I, cause I was too old, my brother, youngest brother, like it, like, I didn't know how amazing he was as a human being when I watched the documentary a couple of years ago. And not long ago, I watched the Tom, um, Hanks version. Right. Right. And there's a line when he's looking, talking to the, um, Esquire, the reporter, right. the, the, and then the reporter's really angry cause he's angry at his father and the way his father treated him. And just when he was a kid, yeah. as an adult, he hadn't gotten over it. And the way that, Tom Hanks, Mr. Rogers says to him, you know, all, all those, all those people and all those experience loved you into being. And there's something yeah. about this yeah. doesn't let people who've inflicted pain off the hook. It doesn't allow, it doesn't let processes that have inflicted pain off the hook. But actually I'm here today showing up in the world the way that I do for better or for worse, having this conversation at this moment in part because of some of that crap that went down. <laughs> in part, you know, it's opened up an opportunity for me in a way, it's a weird mix of, that's kind of weird and crazy, right? But it's also true. So it's why I, I wouldn't want to cancel, yeah, I'd want to cancel the cancer in any culture. Right? <laughs> that's the thing, the cancer is problematic, you know? Um, whiteness in and of itself, like I said, is not the problem, that it represents power is, and the way that, you know, if we understand the idea of white supremacy, the, the, the supremacy, the primacy of it in everybody's lives um, and the opportunities that has afforded for some and not for others, that's the thing I wanna change. Um, ooh, I'm preaching now, preaching. Yeah, Hi, Lucy. Carolyn, hey, um, thank you so much. Um, I've worked in lots of environmental organizations over the years and I really thought your point at the beginning was really, rang true, you know, that sometimes people have a tendency to view their organization in such narrow terms. And so they say, well, this is kind of not our thing. And so as you, one of the things I really appreciated is you started talking about action, you know, it's like, okay, so let's go talk about action. You don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, but you need a new bathtub. And so what does that, you know, that, what does that look like? And you talked about the need to do both a personal assessment and organizational assessment. And as I think about the organizational piece of that, it just seems to me that it really gets down to something very fundamental, which is you really got to examine your mission of your organization. Because you know, any really well-run organization is, um, is, is, uh, is organizing their strategic plan and everything they're doing to achieve their mission. And if you define your mission so narrowly that it doesn't incorporate an understanding of people's place on the land in a very explicit way and the place of people who may not be there now on the land, then you're never gonna get to that, you know? And so I just wanted to share that because I think, you know, I think there's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not that hard a thing to do, but it is something that requires a full organizational commitment to say, we're gonna really take a fresh look at why we exist. And Lucy, I want to say thank you for that. That working, I'm working with a number of organizations right now, um, a number, including the UN Foundation, Pew Charitable Trust, Trust for Public Lands. Um, I, there's so many that I've been doing these workshops and these conversations that actually I would offer that, and I and I take, I would offer that it is hard because what I find that the mission statement is often the DNA of the organization and Actually. it was often set in place um you know at a time when no people a lot of people who look like me and some others on this call would not have been considered you know as part of that for a variety of reasons for better or for worse let's just be i'm going to be light about it for a minute um and getting people to change their dna you know is scary it you know it i understand it to be it's like, am I still going to be who I am? Is my, am I going to be a value? Is my position going to be a value? The knowledge that I, the hard work that I've put in, you know, am I relevant? Am I still relevant? You know, it, it's hard actually for, to get people to get, to, to, to get here. One of the things I talk to people about doing is, um, and I got this, this idea from Sam Grant that I mentioned earlier, you know, this making a map of the ecosystem of relationships that you have mm -hmm. as an organization. If you had to think of your professional organization, uh, professional, yeah, your professional 
Lism, your professional place out in the world, what's the ecosystem of relationships, which will tell you something a little bit about yourself for better or for worse, but you'll start to get a clearer understanding of what that is. When I said earlier about the internal assessment as an organization, that could be an equity audit. That could be any number of things. But also, how do you make a map of, you know, if you look at a year and say, so what are we saying that we want? That's the aspirational piece. And what are the intentions or set of intentions that we're willing to commit to in order to get there? But we are not there. The aspiration is a dream, is a hope, is a desire, but you're not there, right? That's okay. What are the intentions? What are the practices that have to be built over time? What's the capacity that have to be built? What are the leadership model we're using? Are we using the same old leadership model that it's a hierarchy? So we have so-and-so up here, you know, are we willing to think about shared, sharing power differently? You know, maybe what we have to do first before we engage anybody outside of ourselves, excuse me, is do the work within our organization for a year. <laughs> Which means, wait, the public may not think we're doing anything. Yes, this is why it's hard. So it doesn't become symbolic. It actually becomes real work on the ground. It's like, oh crap, we thought we were ready. We're really not because we got to take care of, we got some business to clean up in here first. Um, and when people ask you, you can say that, that you, for institutional memory, you actually record that. You know, it becomes a, pra that's how practices get built is because it's like, we did this thing. This isn't, diversity isn't a conversation we're just having over wine or coffee. <laughs> it's actually work. <laughs> so what would you do for anything else? If you were working on caring for a resource and you would have a list of things that need to be taken care of, what would that list look like in this case? Um, and how do you build those skills? Something as simple as, your budget line. I know many of you heard that before, but man, we keep coming back at that. I have, can't tell you how many times I've heard organizations of various sizes and economic um, privilege say they don't have the budget. But I'm just like, well, then you need to create the, I mean, because you, 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 you know how to do that. You have philanthropy connections, you write grants, you raise money, you, you make a choice, you have meetings around your budget line, you do it all the time. That's why it's not easy. Because now you have to think, oh, we, we have to put a budget line in because it's gonna cost something. Because, oh yes, and I'm just gonna say this very gently, we can't just ask people who know something about this to come in and tell us this information for free. Which isn't to say they wouldn't do it, but oh, that's part of the problem, right? That, that's how it feeds on itself and keeps repeating. It's like, oh my God, equity, 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 reciprocity. Oh, in everything. <laughs> oh crap, what is that gonna look like? Um, and this is the long game. That's why I keep saying it. it's, it's just geologic time, folks. We have to just go down, not the hundred year human being time, but geologic time, right? So yeah, I could keep going, but I'll stop. Usa. <laughs> we have a couple of questions in the chat that are kind of along a similar vein from Anne Prussia and Kim Bick uh, asking about your opinion about kind of coming from local government and working with local conservation organizations, how to widen that outreach to bring a wider audience and bring in more perspectives uh, without putting the burden on those yeah. that to include. And those, I, th I think that's always great, great question because it's a really challenging thing to do, you know. Um, so because language, and I'm just being like this because I'm, I, you know, I can be like this for the moment, so forgive me. Language means everything, don't do outreach. So it, this is the details that really mean something, right? The energy around that. So you wanna build a relationship. You want to discover or rediscover, you know, communities, organizations, individuals, and decide how you would like to meet them, where they are, what does that look like? Um, you can do, you know, a project I've been telling folks lately that well, back when I lived in Berkeley, so this must've been like 2009, 2010 for about three years. It was a project, I sat on a board, advisory board for the Oakland Museum. And the Oakland Museum, you know, has an art history wing, but they also had a science wing. And so they were redoing their science wing. And so this is where they talk about ecology, you know, everything in the state of California, the land, the resources, everything. 
one of the challenges that they were up against is the fact that here they were in Oakland, a predominantly African-American city, but they wanted to get more involvement and more engagement with the African-American people, the families that were there, what might that look like? And one of the um, suggestions that a couple of us made were, you know, well, why don't you engage their stories? You, you know, invite them in invite them to share their stories in the at the end of the day it's actually their stories became part of the display you know whether it was the oakland fires and you could put on a headphone and listen to a child or you could listen to an elderly person or whatever it was they found a way to engage their stories see that, that store those stories as part of being rigorous redefine for yourself what does it mean to be rigorous within our organization what is it we need to know and you know you know, I could take it that just that one thing and the work you'd have to do to be rigorous, everything from confidentiality to be sure you're not just extracting that story, the reciprocity of what are you going to do when they give you that story? What's the exchange? And the exchange isn't always money, right? This is, this is what building relationship is when you, you're like, oh, okay, before we even go out there and put out that invitation, we need to get clear. How are we going to build this relationship? How are we going to be, you know, how is this going to be reciprocated? you know, so that we don't create, recreate some old model of that. So it's almost like every detail of it becomes a learning experience for you and everyone in the organization. Um, and I don't have, I probably don't have to tell you this, but I, I, I like to be reminded that we don't control everything. And, and even when we think we do, we probably don't control most anything. And what's really beautiful about the concept of emergence is that when you start placing yourself as an individual and an organization out there in a very particular way, things are gonna show up that you never expected. I have been having that happen so much this last year that serve my creative needs and generative needs around this work, you know, because we all need to be supported. Self-care, you know, what does that look like? Um, capacity of affirmation, um, all of those things are there. So there's also something is, it's so hard because I know you all are operating differently with different time needs around your organization, but even as something as simple as we're going to have a meeting or a conference or a gathering. One of the reasons I said that I'm willing to go over time with respect to everybody's time, I'm just telling you my secret right here is that sometimes you know we we allot time for something that really we can't do it justice not this conversation and i understand sometimes that's all we got and we just got to work with what we got but the we have to have the flexibility to see that how important is this if we're going to have our weekly meeting are we going to attack the thing about dei on at the end for the last 10 minutes and i'm not saying that's what you do i'm just saying and then we're expect to come up with something new i don't think so are we going to have a conference in a different way that invites and makes space for different voices and different ways of showing up that allows for people within your organization to show up differently one of the things i learned from having these working with different organizations one of the exercises i give them is something I learned from the, an indigenous um, facilitator, Cyra Pinto, who's quite amazing, is when she said, has everybody do introductions, the question she asks is, who are you, where are you from, and who are your people? And this blows everybody in the organization their mind, because they're like, wait, I can't just say that I'm so-and-so, and, -so, and I'm, this is my position, and I said, no, because you got to bring your whole self to bear upon the moment. And one of the most beautiful things about it is that other people in the organization who've been working with them will say, I didn't know that. I didn't. And it's interesting to say, I said, there's no wrong answer here. Bring what you want to bring into the room, right? So you may have that whole saying about, you know, the, the, the genius is here in the room. It's also here in the room. So how do you create space for everybody that's already in the organization to do that? What does that look like? Retreats, gathering, I don't even, you can do whatever you want, but how do you get outside of, as I like to say, outside of the sandbox? I, you know, I tell people, I don't want to play in the sandbox. I want to play on the beach. Who wouldn't prefer to be on the beach? <laughs> you know, that's just way more expansive in thinking, which doesn't mean you're any less attentive, any less rigorous, any less pointed about the choices you make but you have a bigger field with, within which to play in. 
You've talked some about compensation and reciprocity. Uh, and we have a question from Jora Fogg, uh, kind of around that issue, discussing how committees and boards and stuff are usually volunteer based and therefore inaccessible. Wanted to hear if you had any more thoughts about whether those positions should be compensated or other ways to restructure them to make that is so fantastic, Alexis. I couldn't even let you finish getting the question out. That's <laughs> such a good question. Um, I do have some thoughts. Uh, so as somebody who gets asked to serve on a number of boards, and I like to, especially when I move somewhere, you know, I like to be a part of a board in part because I like working on something that's way bigger than my, my circle and being in relationship with that. So whether the the primary board, right now, the only board I just got off one board because it was too much is a board that I'm on. It's actually the organization, the Sustainability Guild, which is outrageous. And you should all look it up for an idea of how to do it differently. And it's an outrageous project. Um, I'm, they're based in Boston, but I'm on their board. So I think that advisory boards are different too than regular boards. I think that I was asked to be on another board and I had to say no, because I was just like, I, I looked at the board and I went and the expectation because some boards expect tithing. There's a degree with of which you contribute financially and depending on who's in the board and that expectation or the assumptions there that that can become um, a, ba a boundary. Uh, yeah, is that what I wanna say? That can become a reason why people can't do it. It can inhibit people's uh, involvement. I think it depends. I think it's a case by case basis. I think that any board right now, I'm gonna make a broad statement. You can disagree. Any board right now that's actively saying we want to be more diverse and, you know, and we want to think of it, you know, take these ideas to the organization. We're responsible for supporting the um, organization. Um, any board right now who's saying that has to the better first be looking at it, it better it'd be just looking at the looking in the mirror and say, then what are you willing to change? So what are you willing to change? And just be honest. And there's going to be things you're not going to be willing to change or maybe just not willing to change right now. Make a list. Let's be really clear. So that when we approach somebody, you know, people, regardless of their, I don't have to tell you this either, their economic background, their educational background, um, how old they are, what part of the country they're from. Generally speaking, people aren't stupid. People have a sense of themselves when you, when, when you make the ask. I and mean, then what I mean by that is they, they don't have to know everything about who you are, but they have a pretty good sense of who they are. <laughs> so what is really useful is to say like, oh, you know, here's who we are. You know, here's what we can do right now. Here's where we're not able to do right now or we're unwilling to tackle. We're taking this at a time. The honesty of a board up front, that makes it really, because you're asking somebody to join you to be part of creating and recreating who you are and want to be. You're asking somebody to join you on the ride and help construct that bathtub. Um, don't trick them. In, I, I'm not saying you're tricking them, but don't get them on there because I, I, it's happened. It's happened to me. I know it's happened to other folks who call me. I know. You get on there and say, they said one thing and then you got on, you're like, oh no, there's something else going on here, right? And, and it could be sometimes because they weren't even aware of it. So I would say to the board to, to do an assessment of what that is. And it may be for one board that compensation. I want to say something about this. So because I just had this happen to me yesterday on the phone with a, a group that I'm not going to mention that was asking me to do something that the group themselves come from a very privileged sector of people economically and um, that didn't want to pay me for something they were asking me to do because nobody was getting paid. That was the answer, right? But I was the brown person, but okay. So, and I, you know, I would, I will do it for without getting paid because I believe in the thing, but I, you know, then the, the response was, but we were told that if it's environmental justice, we definitely have to pay. Now you might think that made me feel better, but that made me feel worse. Cause I was like, oh, I'm not like the poor, like now, what <laughs> like like so if you're the poor black or brown person you'll get money but anybody else who won't no not one rule for me and then one rule for somebody else it actually needs to be consistent within that board and organization to recognize equity and reciprocity and what 
what are what does that look like for us? Does that mean compensation? Does that mean power share? Does that mean collaboration and allyship? What does that mean, you know, opportunity to move up in the organization? I don't know. Figure out what those things are. Letting somebody know when they come in, you know, um, we're redesigning what it means to be on a board. What does it mean to be on a board? Why do why we want to invite you to be on a board? Because we believe your knowledge and experience is worth something. It has value. And we want to build relationship with you and as you help us think about creating this new bathtub. Does that make sense? So there's no one answer. It's just figuring out what the answer is for each organization and being honest about it and explicit. Yeah, Maybe one you. more question. Because I, I can see y'all keep me on here. We'd be on here. I have another call at 5.30, so I got to have a short break, but I'll, one more question. Yeah, there's, there's some questions we won't be able to get to, but I thought we'd wrap it up with a question from Carmel, who wanted to get information about requesting you to speak in the future at other virtual events in California. Go Carmel. Um, just if you, I can tell you my email and I'll, I'll say it, Finney someplace at Gmail, but if you forget that, if you go to carolynfinney.com and then you'll go to my contact page, that's where the email will come to, which is my Finney's, Finney's home place, all one word, at gmail.com. But carolynfinney.com is easier to remember and then it'll come to me. And I warn you in advance, it may take me a minute to respond because I'm a, I, I tell everybody I've reached this place where I have no infrastructure. So it's been coming like this for the last couple of years when before I was on a plane every week, but I'm so busy now, I have no infrastructure. So I'm doing everything. So I'm doing the work of an organization and I'm also running the organization. And I, my skill set at running the organization, there's a reason why I don't actually run an organization. So um, yeah, but yes, please, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, if it's all right with you, I can also include your email address in the follow-up email that I send out with the recording. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. And and Alexis, can you save, because I haven't been reading the chat thing because I can't do it while I'm talking and listening, but I'd love to see people's comments and other questions. And Yeah, the, the chat gets saved as well with the recording, so I can send that to you. Fantastic. So I want to say thank you so much for doing this talk. It was great. And thank you to everyone who has stuck around this yeah. long. Yeah, the hardcore 44. Thank you. <laughs> Keep an eye on your email inboxes. I'll be sending out a follow-up email soon with a recording of this event and some other information as well. Yeah. Thank Hope you all. Great afternoon. Yeah.